Hey guys, this is Mr. Gregory. This is our first question during quarantine. Um, I want to make this as painless as I can for you guys and as simple as I can for you guys. Basically, we're going to continue with our curriculum um, of ancient civilizations for the sixth grade. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach a copy of our documents. Then I'm going to post a video, which you're watching now, and then I'm going to go through those documents. And then at the end of it, I'll have you answer our essential question. And you can give me that answer via Google Classroom. Um, one thing we've got to sort out before we go any further is you guys started writing your answers for ancient, ancient Egypt. Um, and a lot of you were doing that uh, by handwriting. And obviously you can't get that to me now while we're in quarantine. So... Um, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to talk to a couple people on staff about the best way to do that. It might be best um, to hand that in to me when we get back to school, if we get back to school. I think we probably will at some point. Um, but it would probably be best to turn it in that way. If not, I'll see if there's another way I can give you guys credit for that because I know you worked very hard on that. Um, anyway, what we're going to do here is we're going to answer the question, was ancient Greece truly democratic? Now, before we do that, let's talk about what democratic means. Guys, democracy is just a system of government run by the people. Not a few people, um, not one person, all of the people. All of the people have a say. If it's not all of the people, it's not truly democracy. So, you know, the United States is an example of a democracy in the sense that we elect the people's voice, we elect people to go run the government for us. Now that's called a republic, don't worry about that, that's a minor detail for this. The idea being everybody is allowed to vote. Now historically in this country that wasn't always the case. If you were African American, if you were Native American, if you were a woman, if you didn't own property, you weren't allowed to vote for a long time in this country. Today, pretty much everyone's able to vote, with some exceptions, which we can talk about another time. But a democracy is the idea that everyone has a say, everyone has a voice, the people have the power, not individuals, not one person. Um, so the question is, ancient Greece, how democratic were they? They were given a lot of the credit for the ideas of modern democracy, ancient Greece was. And so, do they deserve that credit? Were they actually democratic? Today what we're going to do is take a look. So if you take a look at those documents that I posted in Google Classroom, I'm going to go through them one by one and I'll explain them to you. You don't have to agree with me. Uh, I'm going to leave a lot of it up in the air. And then when it's all done, I want you to answer the question, was ancient Greece truly democratic? And you can type that and email it to me. You can send it to me through Google Classroom, whatever works. And I'll do my best to put in a grade. Um, obviously, I got to school about a week before this whole quarantine started. So I don't have uh, access to the grade book yet, but I'm working on that. So I'll do my best with that. Okay? All right. Let's get started. So if you go to document A, the very first document is from Pericles. The following excerpt is from a speech known as the Funeral Oration, delivered by Athenian general and politician Pericles in 431 BCE. Pericles was widely seen as the leader of Athens. He gave this speech during a funeral for Athenian soldiers who died in the first year of the brutal Peloponnesian War against Sparta, Athens' chief rival. The Athenian historian Thucydides included the speech in his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War. Historians are not sure when Thucydides wrote down the speech or how close his version was to the original. Our constitution favors the many instead of the few. This is why it is called a democracy. If we look to the laws, they give equal justice to all. Advancement in public life falls to one's reputation for good work. Social class is not allowed to interfere with someone's merit, and poverty does not block the way. If a man is able to serve the state, he's not stopped by the obscurity of his condition. The freedom 
which we enjoy in our government, extends also to our ordinary life. There, far from being jealous of each other, we do not feel called upon to be angry with our neighbor for doing what he likes. But all this ease in our private lives does not make us lawless as citizens. Fear is our chief protection against this, teaching us to obey the magistrates and the laws. Now, don't feel like you had to understand every single thing that was said there. All right. Whenever you read something large or whenever you read something complex, simply break it down. Okay, and that's what I'm going to do now. Um, let's start with a couple of vocabulary words. If you go to the bottom here, social class is someone's position in society, whether they're you know the lower classes, middle class, working class, upper class. That's what social class means. Merit means someone's talent, skills, or qualifications. Obscurity is unknown or important, and magistrates means government officials. So if you look at that last line there, he says, teaching us to obey the magistrates and the laws. Okay, so obey the government officials and the laws that they create. So when I read this, it sounds like Pericles thinks that ancient Greece was fairly democratic. Now, how do I know that? And again, this is what you'll have to do in your assignment. How do I know that he thinks that? Well, let me look at the text. If I look at the text, he says, Social class is not allowed to interfere with someone's merit, and poverty does not block the way. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not stopped by the obscurity of his condition. So in other words, what Pericles is saying is it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you're valued, your voice is valued in our democracy. Our system does not merely favor people based on their class. It doesn't only favor the rich. That sounds pretty democratic to me. So I would tend to agree with Pericles based on what he's saying. But this is only one source. Let's see if there's anything else in this source before we move on. He says, um, if we look to the laws, they give equal justice to all. Advancement in public life falls to one's reputation for good work. So basically he's saying, Laws are applied equally to everyone. That's fair. That sounds democratic. And if you advance in public life, it comes down to the ability you have to do a good job. Sounds fairly democratic. You're not held back by your class, once again. Um, and then he goes on to say, freedom which we enjoy in our government extends to our ordinary life. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. So it sounds like Pericles thinks we are pretty democratic. So I'm going to skip on to document B, mainly because I want this to be relatively short. I don't want you spending your whole day doing this. Um, let's move on to document B, the Athenian Constitution. The following excerpt comes from the Athenian Constitution, written by the Greek philosopher Aristotle between 330 and 322 BCE. Aristotle was the leading Greek philosopher of the time, <coughs> excuse me, and is credited with writing accounts of the constitutions of 170 different Greek states. All right, so let's see what Aristotle wrote about it. At the time that we are speaking, the people have secured control of the state and established the constitution which exists at the present day. The democracy has made itself master of everything and administers everything by its votes in the assembly and by the law courts. All right, whatever, let's just move on. The present state of the constitution is as follows. The franchise is open to all men who are citizen birth by both parents. They are enrolled as citizens by the age of 18. On the occasion of their enrollment, the current citizens give their votes first on whether the new candidates appear to be of the age set by the law. If the candidates are not the right age, they are dismissed back into the ranks of boys. Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, the current citizens give their votes on whether the candidate is freeborn and has two citizen parents as the laws require. If they decide that he is not a free man, they can appeal to the law courts. If the court decides that he has the, no right to be enrolled as a citizen, he is sold by Athens as a slave. Oh, let's keep going. If he wins his case, he has the right to be enrolled as a citizen without further question. All the magistrates that are responsible for the ordinary routine of administration are elected by lot in the assembly. 
However, the military treasurer, the commissioners of the festival fund, and the superintendent of the water supply are elected by vote. All military officers are also elected by vote. Interesting. So Aristotle has a few examples here of democracy, people being elected by vote. All right, that sounds pretty democratic. But then people have to justify whether they're citizens of this state or not. Being a human being isn't good enough. Are they born to Athenian parents, right? Are they residents of that area? Okay, I guess people want to know, are people from Athens actually voting? All right, fine. But this is key. Aristotle says, if you were born a slave, then you have no right to be enrolled as a citizen. I'm sorry, slaves are people. And if democracy is a government ruled by all the people, well then... How can you have a democracy if you have slavery? That doesn't really sound like a democracy to me. So, I'm kind of torn here. I think Aristotle is proving that this is a democracy, but also isn't a democracy. It is because people vote. It isn't because there's slavery. So, I would lean towards no after reading this one. Let's go to document C. The Athenian population. So, we have a chart here. The data below comes from the book Wealthy Hellas, written by Professor Josiah Ober in 2010. Ober is a professor of classical civilization and political science at Stanford University. So take a look at this chart. It's broken up by, from uh, left to right, population group, the total of n number of people in that group, what percentage that group makes up of the population, and then does that group has the, have the ability to vote? Okay, looking at the left column, it says citizen men, citizen women, s children of citizens, medics, if you read the bottom, medics were foreigners or, or, or Greeks from other city-states that were living in Athens, so you can think of them as like immigrants, and then slaves. Okay, so those are the five different groups on our left column, population group. Look at the next column on the right, total number of people. Citizen men and citizen women both make up 29, roughly 29,000, 30,000. Children, it's a lot, 74,000, more than that. Medics make up over 25,000, and then slaves make up roughly 80,000. Go to the percentage of the population. Clearly, most of the percentage of the population was slaves in 34%. So most people in Athens were slaves. Medics make up 11%, children make up 31%, and then men and women both make up, respectively, 12%. But then when you go to the ability to vote, women, no, children of citizens, no, medics, no, slaves, no, no surprise there, the only people who could vote were citizen men. So 12% of the actual population that could vote were men and men alone, citizen men. The percentage, yeah, the, the only percentage was 12%. I mean, that's crazy, guys. If only 12% of the population can vote, that's not democracy. That's not ruled by all of the people. That's ruled by some of the people, and that's not democratic. So we've got evidence to say that it was democratic, and now I've just read you two things that say it's not democratic. Why? Because, well, they had slavery. And another reason, women can't vote. Look, I get why you make a case for children. I understand that. Maybe you could say children aren't developed enough to vote yet. Fine, I understand that. Medics, okay, we're not going to let foreigners vote. I, I don't necessarily agree with that logic, but... Every country in the world basically does that. So fine, fair enough. Slaves, we just talked about that, why that's wrong. But women, you don't allow citizen women. So this is very sexist. All right, so let's move on to document E, Professor Camp. Professor John Camp directs excavations of the Athenian Agora, which was the gathering place in ancient Athens. He is also a professor of classics at Randolph-Macon College. This is an excerpt from an opinion article he wrote in the New York Times in 2003. Okay. Once a year, the Athenians would meet and vote on a simple question. 
is anyone becoming a threat to democracy? If a simple majority voted yes, then they dispersed and reassembled two months later. They brought with them their ostracon, a fragment of pottery, on which they had scratched the name of the person they thought represented a threat. Excuse me. The man with the most votes lost. He was exiled for ten years. And this was thought to call him any anti-democratic leanings he might have. In other words, the Athenians not only voted people into office, but they had a regular procedure for voting one person per year out of office. It was an option which could be exercised, but did not have to be. The exile did not involve confiscation or any other punitive measures, meaning punishment. It was designed only to remove an individual from the political arena. The Athenians were better than we are at enforcing accountability in the public officials. Almost every prominent statesman of Athens in the early 5th century BC took one of these 10-year vacations courtesy of the Athenian people. There may be pitfalls. One batch of 90 ostraca found in Athens, all with the name Themis Themistocles, turned out to be all written by only 13 individuals. The other danger is that if a leading statesman is powerful enough and has the votes, ostracism is a great way to eliminate a weaker but annoying political rival. In 417 BC, when the outcome was uncertain, the two top dogs ganged up on the hyperbolos, a hapless number three. This was such an obvious misuse of the system that the Athenians never used it again. Okay, there was a lot in there, so let me explain it to you and break it down. Basically, what happened was, once a year, the Athenians would meet and they would say, is anybody a threat to democracy? But instead of actually trying to figure out if these people were a threat to democracy, what would happen was a couple of people in Athens would gang up on somebody that was a political rival or somebody that they didn't like, and they would basically gang up on that person, get a majority vote, and then kick that person out of society for 10 years. This sometimes is referred to as the tyranny of the majority. In other words, the abuse of power of having a majority. Um, it's like bullying. It's like if a gang of people gangs up on one person. This is the same sort of thing. And what the ancient Greeks slowly start to realize after a few years is that after the example they give here, 190 people that were ostracized, that were exiled and kicked out, were all voted on by 13 people. So that means 13 people had this incredible amount of power to kick out 190 different people. That's not democracy. That is being petty. That is an abuse of power. And so this doesn't sound very democratic. So here's what you guys have to do. You guys have to use some of these documents and use as little or as much as you want, it's up to you, and answer this question. How democratic, how was ancient Greece truly democratic? I can say from the evidence, it doesn't sound like they were very democratic. And we went through each document and sort of explained why. I don't care what kind of answer you give me. If you say, hey, at the end of the day, it's still democracy and here's why I think so, in 10 to 15 sentences, fine, no problem. Because it's your answer. If you want to say, nah, Mr. Gregory, it's not democratic. Here's all the reasons why. I'll give you all these reasons in 10 to 15 sentences. It's all good. As long as you can back it up, that's all I care about. Okay? So I'm done really explaining in this video. Um, if you're struggling and you really don't understand why, you can send me an email. It's james.gregory at lausd.net. But I think you guys are smart enough to figure this one out. All you have to do is go through each of the documents, as we did, and you can rewind this video if you need to, and decide, was it really democratic? Remember, democracy is ruled by all of the people. And from most of these documents, it sounds like it wasn't ruled by all the people. So give me examples as to why in about 10 to 15 sentences. Do the best you can. This is a 10-point assignment, and the due date should be here on Google Classroom somewhere. And email me if you have any questions. I'd be glad to help you. And, um, yeah, enjoy, guys.